We cannot reject the past, nor can we change the past. We must embrace it and take comfort in knowing that the African-American people came through such trials not just once, but over and over again. Betty Kilby, lead plaintiff in the case of Kilby versus Warren County School Board. On May 14, 1954, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in the landmark case of Brown versus the Board of Education that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. After a year of appeals, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Brown II that the segregation should move forward with all deliberate speed. While this was intended to provide a degree of flexibility to localities, it also opened the doors to countless delays and acts of segregationist resistance. The first court order to compel the segregation of a public school in Virginia was handed down by Judge John Paul at the Federal Courthouse in Harrisonburg, Virginia. On July 12, 1956, in the case of Allen v. Charlottesville School Board, Judge Paul ruled in favor of 12 black students seeking admittance to Venable Elementary and Lane High School. At a time when many other judges found excuses for delay in the Brown II decision, Judge Paul found that equal education for the student plaintiff outweighed the so-called implementation concern of the Charlottesville City School Board. The NAACP attorneys who brought forward the Allen case were Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. As the two were leaving Judge Paul's chambers in Harrisonburg, Hill remarked to Robinson, I think we've got ourselves a real judge here. I just remember going in the courthouse with my mother, NAACP, uh, doing the whole court case with Judge John Paul. And that name just have stayed with me over the years. I, I remember my parents and folk talking about Judge John Paul. One month after Judge Paul's decision, a special session of the Virginia legislature convened in Richmond in order to pass a number of massive resistance law aimed at preventing racial integration. Of course, the governor at that time, I think it was Governor Allman, uh, he proclaimed that there would never be an integration schools, that before that would happen, he would lose his right arm. That integration, mixing of the races in great areas of Virginia would absolutely destroy public education. Two more years of court appeal swept by before the showdown over massive resistance finally burst into public view. Warren County was one of 17 school divisions in Virginia without a black high school. African American students were forced to attend schools outside of the county, and those schools were provided with only secondhand materials. The problem with the daily commute was they gave him the rookie the old buses, and the bus broke down on the side of the road. They would wait until the white bus driver went home from school, took his load home, went home, ate his dinner, and then he came after the African-American children. They were on the highway until almost mid, well, they didn't get home until almost midnight. You get home and your parents would be uh, standing there with their arms crossed, you know, oh my God, what took so long? Oh, well, the bus broke down again. Because we were getting old school books from, you know, books from what came from the white kids' school. They passed them on down to us, and that's what we had. We had to always take the secondhand things, and our parents just wanted better for us. The case of Kilby versus Warren County School Board was brought forth by a black parent named James Kilby on behalf of his children and several others in the Front Royal community. Betty Kilby's father was one of the main leaders that started this. He had said that he did not want his children to go, have to go 
like 60 or 70 miles to Manassas School when we have a school right here in Warren County. I mean, he felt very strongly, I pay taxes, my kids should be able to go to the schools. And he started having little meetings and parents would come around and listen to him. And of course, you know, what parent wouldn't want that child to have a better education and not to have to go, you know, that distance. In the spring of 1958, Mr. Kilby retained Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. All of a sudden, Oliver Hill saw a solution uh, to his problem. And one of the things that he told him, he said, if I take this case, he said, once you're committed, you're going to have to stay with it. We filed a petition on August the 29th, 1958. And um, he wrote the letter, and then it went before Judge Paul. Such a stand in a small Virginia town was going to create tension and animosity. Anyone who was associated with the case faced backlash from those who resisted integration. Anne Marks, who was the daughter of one of the people that was helping us, her and I, uh, we would go walking around the streets of Harrisonburg. She was younger than me. She was white. And so one day she decided that we should go to lunch. And uh, we walked into this restaurant and um, they called me the N word. He told me, you can stay, but that N has to go. And so we couldn't stay in the restaurant to eat. So after that, um, they made us sit in the back of the courtroom. I had received so much harassment while I was at the University of Virginia because of the fact my name was a duplicative the judge who was integrating the Charlottesville schools. On September 4th, 1958, Judge Paul ruled in favor of the black student plaintiff and ordered their admittance to Warren County High School. Eight days later, Governor Lindsay Almond forcibly closed the school. We uh, got uh, notice that they had closed the high schools. So I got a telephone call. I was at work, and uh, I got a telephone call that I had to go up to the school and get clean out my locker because uh, they had closed the schools. When the 21 black students walked up to the hill to Warren County High School, they were met with closed doors and ongoing resistance. So we went back down the hill and went back and got in the car and, and left. The following week, Governor Almond closed Venable Elementary School and Lane High School in Charlottesville in order to prevent the admittance of 12 black students. The schools closed. The governor decided to close the schools here in Charlottesville in 1958. And then uh, we couldn't even actually go to the school, so we missed a lot of time just sitting at home because of uh, the rulings that had passed down where they did not allow us to go into the county school. I had nightmares that I was running after the school bus, but the school bus didn't stop to pick me up. I got to the school building and I couldn't find my locker. And then I would wake up and know I wasn't going to school. I had no school to go to. You know, we were only young children. Did not know half of what was going on, but all we wanted was an education. Black churches and organizations such as the NAACP responded by finding alternate schools for the black students to attend while Hill and Robinson fought against the school closures in the courts. Unlike their black counterparts, white families were able to use state tuition grants to form a private academy in Front Royal they had built another school for the white kids. Bill, uh, you're a senior in high school? Yes, sir. That's right. You attend a private school? Yes, sir, I did. We built Mosby Academy for them to attend school, whereas you could not build a high school even for the black students here. The school closures lingered on through the winter until the state Supreme Court and the Federal Court of Appeals issued simultaneous rulings declaring 
massive resistance to be unconstitutional. Finally, in February of 1959, Federal Judge John Paul ordered the reopening of Warren County High School. But this judge wasn't going to play games. He was going to abide by the law and enforce the law. And, of course, when the decision came from Judge Paul, he felt that our feelings was that he had heard enough of the back and forth and just made the final decision to open the schools immediately. Hearing news of the latest ruling made attendant a formerly all-white school a reality for black children. So, all of a sudden in my 12th grade year, the teacher spoke up and asked, is there anyone here that would like to go to Warren County High School? And I'm thinking, oh, I don't have to be bused anymore. And I don't know what came over me. My hand just shot up like somebody would have had a string on the end of my arm. And she said that she had raised her hand because he did not want to be bused again. What kind of stupidness is this? I had a wonderful time on the bus. So when my mother came down one night and they said, okay, the Coleman girls and some of the other girls, you have to leave because your parents have signed a petition for you to go to Warren County High School. I was totally shocked. And you know, I was scared because uh, that was a whole different world for us. I was shocked because our parents, back in the day, your parents never asked you, did you want to go? It's when I went to visit my cousin up to Bentonville, and she said, your name was in the paper. You're going to the white school. No, I'm not either. The next thing I know, well, we're going to school. We're going here. Warren County High School was forced to open its doors for the 21 black students on February 18, 1959. The night before that we were supposed to go to the school, I was standing at the kitchen sink. And I was washing dishes when shots was fired at the house. And I woke to my mother slapping me on the face because she thought I had gotten shot. But the next morning when we got ready, got up, um, I told my mama that I was sick. And she told me that I just had butterflies in my stomach. And as soon as I got some of those pancakes, pancakes was my favorite. And as soon as I got some of those pancakes, that I would be okay. Oh, that was a day and a half. You talk about the bad side of people coming out. It came out. You think your child's doing better in a he, I think he is doing better. He's taking more interest, and I think he appreciates it more. And uh, do you intend to keep them there? I absolutely do. They let us off at the foot of the hill, and we had to walk past the crowd and up the hill to the school. And my brothers was in the car with me. And when we got out, this one white woman, she yelled, we're going to kill all you little niggas. And I was only 13, and I was scared. And then my, Jim, my brother Jimmy pushed me in the back. But I began to recite, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then I skipped down to Yeh, though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And after that, I wasn't afraid anymore. I think every military person that was in the world was there. They had, uh, I guess it was the Coast Guard, or they had police, they had military people, because they weren't sure what was going to happen, because they hated us. All our parents said to us was, do not, do not, Look back, keep walking, don't turn around. Whenever you hear the fear in the adult's voice, and no matter how much they try to hide their fear, you, you hear it and it makes you afraid. Everybody stared at us as if we were trash, you know, just what are you doing here? Leave, you know, you don't belong here. They called us all kinds of names. And we had mobs of people out there and all the name callers. 
go home niggas, we don't want you here. And the rocks that was throwing and it was just so ugly. And of course we were frightened to death, so scared. I'll never forget, we were so scared. Got to the school and Mr. Duff was the principal. He held us in such low esteem that when this little girl, hello, how are you? He didn't even speak. He looked at me as if I didn't even exist. It was, it was a trying day. We can't even walk up the hill now without crying. The white students continued to attend private schools at the new Mosby Academy. The 21 African-American teens were the only students enrolled in the high school that year. And we were by ourselves. It was 21 or 20 kids in a whole big school with a few teachers. Now we walking around in school, damn, we got bold. We bad, we know we bad. We walking through the halls doing our little chant uh, because we had taken over this school that once housed a thousand. And because they didn't come back, it to us, us kids, it was like we took over and we won. And for that brief time, we did. The lone senior of the Warren County class of 1959 was a young woman named Ann Rhodes. She didn't get the senior year that most dreamed of. I, I can remember hearing my English teacher saying, Ann, go to the jewelry store and order your class ring. Okay. My mother and I went to the jewelry store. We ordered my class ring, which was Warren County High School, 1959. Okay. I was to get my diploma, which says Ann Rhodes, Warren County High School, 1959. So when my class ring came in, we went to pick it up. Went to the jewelry store. The jeweler would not let me have it because no other student would have gotten a class ring that said Warren County High School, 1959. That was the only one. So, in order for me to get a diploma, Warren County High Warren County School Board said, oh no, you don't have enough credits. <laughs> now I've gone through school, I've had all of my credits, and all of a sudden, now I don't have enough. Not realizing that by me putting my hand up, saying that I wanted to go to Warren County High School so that I would not have to be bused for my final year of school, you know, that I was going to miss out on so much. The following school year, a number of white students began to return to the public schools. Following year, that's when the fear really hit us. That's when we really got frightened. The 21 of us, we still remained it together because we were all we had. One another, that was all we had. I get up in the morning and I said, oh, why do I have to go? Do I have? To? Yeah, it was awful because, you know, when you're living in, if you're in an environment where everybody just look at you mean and say, we don't want you here and say hateful things. How could you not, you know, how could you like going to a place like that? It was awful. I remember going to class uh, in my English class and in my French class. Uh, of course, I was the only black person there in that one class can't remember which one it was. And all of the other students and the white kids came and they sit all in the back. And I was determined I wasn't gonna sit in the back because that's usually, we've been told to sit in the back. So I sat right up in the front seat 
and all the white kids came and they went in the back. Nobody would sit near me. But it was okay. I survived that. But it was so frightening, you know, just, you just felt so tense and so scared and you couldn't wait to get home. I remember I came home one day. I told my mom I was not going back. Every day, all around my chair was spitballs. And the teacher never said anything. We knew we never had a prom. We never had, we never had sports. Uh, we couldn't, I mean, there was nothing. It was nothing but going to class and that was it. They formed clubs that we couldn't participate in that um, did the prom, so we couldn't go to the prom. And, and I think that that was, it kind of like ruined the best years of my life. I think the people who faced the real challenge were the kids, the black children who had to go to an almost totally white school and what they had to face. And it takes courage to do that, a lot of courage. And on top of that, think of what their parents worried about. My little girl or my young son is going into a building where he may not be wanted and may be hurt. I would think as a parent, I would be concerned, highly anxious. As many of the original plaintiffs graduated, life became even more challenging for the remaining few. By the time I got to my senior year, it was only five of us left. Five black children in a school of about eight to 900 students. I just made up my mind that if that was gonna be the year I died, it would be the year I died, and death would, be, would have been more humane than to constantly have to watch your back and wonder what was gonna happen to you. That was the biggest mistake of my life because that's when I got raped. And of all of the things that had happened to me, that was the only one that just took the life and breath out of me. And it was so hard for me to recover from that. Um, and I, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, and I ended up in the hospital. The faith agency and resilience of the black students in Warren County and Charlottesville provided them with the strength to keep going in spite of the resistance and discrimination they were forced to confront. And one day this little girl, she looked at me and she I, I, um, I was doing this as I was walking down the hall. And she looked at me and she wanted to know what I was doing. And at that point, I was being taunted. So I told her God was holding my hands. And she called me a stupid girl. And you know, just keep your distance, you know, be respectful and keep, keep going. That's what my mother would say to us. Deserve to be there just as well. She would say things like that. Just as well as the white kids, this is, you know, this is your school here, this is your county. And she would tell us we gotta get up and go. People would always accuse me of smiling a lot. So I think maybe a smile, and even today, sort of maybe offset some of the negativity. But I would talk to God so that I could have God's protection. And they had taught us, if God be for you, then you've got, you've got the big man upstairs watching over you. I tried. When I was there, I tried. I held my hair up as much as I could, and I did. And even though it hurt so bad, you know, you'd swallow and hold your head up, but it hurt. It's very scary. You just hated being there. And I now understand how soldiers feel. It is a battle. And so you go back every day, whether you want to or not. 
Many years passed before Warren County acknowledged the accomplishments of the only senior in the class of 1959. And the only way that I got it, my high school diploma, was 19 years later. The black students at the forefront of school desegregation paid an enormous price. As the children grew, so did their understanding of the necessity of such a sacrifice. I can say that the one good thing out of all of it is my children. They did not have to go through what I had to go through. That is the one reason, I guess, behind all of it. That is the reason that I held my hand up, that I wanted to go to Warren County High School. I'm so glad that we did have that opportunity to do that, because that was the, I guess, real reason behind it, you know, so that other kids, you know, could go to the school and have the opportunity that we didn't have. So, yes, I do. I'm very proud that we did that. Even though it was hard, I'm glad we did it. And my grandkids asked me, Nana, how do you feel? How did you feel going to that school? I said, Josh, or one of the kids who would ask me, one of the kids, I said, oh, don't worry, you will never experience that in life. I accomplished something. I made them open the gates for the grandkids and you know, just opened the way for them how to, you know, what to expect, what not to expect. If it hadn't have been for that time, where would they be today? Their powerful legacy continues into the world we inherit as we attempt to reconcile this difficult past and seek to further heal hearts and minds in building a better future. I think it should not be forgotten. The situation has made all of us very, very strong. I don't, I don't have any ill feelings at all about, you know, what had happened back then. I'm strongly into the Bible, and um, I know you're supposed to let go and let go, and I have. I don't have any ill feelings to any of them. You know, if they don't accept me, it's okay, but I didn't get where I am. By the grace of somebody accepting me, I got where I am in life by the grace of God. You know, I feel like that I'm blessed with a good life. Mm -hmm. I suggest that you look in the mirror and you say, I am a child of God, full of grace and beauty. And if God be for me, then who should be against me? You have to take a way to be positive and to be strong and always stand for your rights and what you believe in your fellow man, the way that you want to be treated. To me, that is the best advice that I can give anybody. Dr. King is one of my heroes. Dr. King also talked about the beloved community. It's a just and equal society where we have love for one another. And, and it would be simply, learn all you can and be kind. These courageous students were willing to stand alongside daring attorneys who sought justice before principal judges within the courtroom of democracy. We returned to talk about the lawyers and how great they were or we talk about a judge and how great his decision was but no I still think it's the children that were the real heroes the legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls but it cannot build bridges that job belongs to you and me Shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. 
Shall not. 